Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for joining us at Church Online this morning. To begin our service today, I want to share with you Psalm 100, which in Scripture is actually subtitled as a Psalm of Thanksgiving. And the Word of God says, Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Do you have anything that you're thankful for today? I pray that today you can align your mind and your heart with the goodness of God, with the fact that you are His, that you are loved by Him. So welcome to Church Online. Let us worship God together. Que precioso es tu amor Infinito como el cielo es tu amor Oh Precioso es tu amor, extravagante y firme como las montañas. Oh, qué precioso es tu amor. No conoce las fronteras tu amor. Oh, qué precioso es tu amor. Inagotable sobrepasa aún las nubes. Oh. Jesús eres la fuente de amor, tú me permites beber del río de tus delicias. Bebo de la unción que fluye de ti, sumergido estoy, brota hasta llenarme. Eres eternamente amor, profundo e infinito. Tan grande que sacia la sed de mi corazón Derrama de tu amor, de mi familia de amor Quiero vivir sumergido en tu presencia Señor oh, 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 oh. Bebo de la unción que fluye de ti, sumergido estoy, brota hasta llenarme. Eres eternamente amor, profundo y finito, tan grande que sacia la sed de mi corazón. Derrama de tu amor, de tu infalible amor, quiero vivir sumergido en tu presencia, Señor, eres eternamente amor, profundo e infinito, tan grande que sacia la sed de mi corazón, derrama de tu amor, de tu infalible amor, quiero vivir sumergido en tu presencia, Señor, tú te acercas a mí, me apartas con cuerdas de amor, Sé que tú eres mi todo, yo a ti te pertenezco Tú te acercas a mí, me apartas con cuerdas de amor En las cicatrices de Cristo veo tu eterno amor Tú te acercas a mí, me apartas con cuerdas de amor Sé que tú eres mi todo, yo a ti te pertenezco Tú te acercas a mí, me apartas con cuerdas de amor En las cicatrices de Cristo veo tu eterno amor
Hello, everybody, one more time. God bless you. Thanks again for joining us at Church Online. If you're just now joining us or if this is your first time with us at Church Online, I want to welcome you personally. My name is Aníbal Figueroa. I'm the pastor of Nuevo Amanecer Church, and it really is a great pleasure and an honor to have you with us this morning. Before we continue and go into our message today, I actually want to share an important announcement and is that next Sunday, July the 19th, we're actually hoping to have church at the park again. Amen. If you were with us last time on Father's Day, we're actually going to be in the same exact place. We want to have church at Tom Sawyer Park at 11 a.m. next Sunday, July the 19th. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I want to invite you to come and also remember to bring anything and everything that you're going to need. Bring your own chairs, bring your own blanket so that you can sit with us, so that you can sing and worship God with us. And again, so that we can study God's word together. And I want to say that it's going to be church at the park. You are not expected to come and stay and hang out for a while. If you just want to come sing, hear God's word and leave, you can do that. We're going to practice safe distancing. So don't worry, you are going to be safe. If you want to bring a mask and all that, you're welcome to do that. But we are going to be outdoors. We are going to practice this safe distancing so you don't have to be afraid um, but if you do want to hang out and, and bring a little snack so that you can share um, you know and, and have community with other people you are also welcome to do that but uh, all in all I really hope to see you next Sunday July the 19th church at the park Tom Sawyer at 11 a.m. amen so with that said um, let us go ahead and uh, jump into the third and final week of our message series titled Spiritual Warfare. We've been talking about what does spiritual warfare look like in a day-to-day -day basis. We've been looking at the more practical, more subtle ways that the enemy attacks us. Uh, and I hope that you have learned and that you have embraced and, and, and that you have applied maybe some of these new truths uh, when you find yourself in spiritual battle. And today, I believe, is the most important thing that we're going to talk about today because I believe this is the most common way that the enemy attacks us in a day-to-day -day basis in our journey with the Lord. So again, I invite you to lean in to what God wants to speak to you today. Now, again, if this is your first time with us or the first week that you're with us in this series, I want to warn you up front. Um, I actually didn't preach this message live. I didn't record it live for today, but instead we are revisiting a message series that I recorded in the year 2018. Uh, so that's why, and it was recorded at our church. That's why I'm there. That's why there's people there because as a church, we're still strictly online uh, and we'll give you some some announcements of you know when when we expect to be back at the building but uh, but again although it's recorded and it's a few years old I believe that the principles and the truth that we're gonna be discussing are very much real very much relevant and I believe that they will minister to you so again I invite you to lean in to what God wants to speak to you today amen so with that said it's just a brief introduction uh, let us pray so that we can uh, jump right into our study. Oramos. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. And thank you now, God, that as we devote and dedicate this time and this space to study your word, God, thank you that you speak to us. I pray that today's message is not heard as something that I said or my thoughts or my ideas, but speak to us personally. Let your Holy Spirit minister to our hearts in a personal and powerful way so that we may experience your grace, your love, and your transforming power. And God, I pray all these things and I give you thanks and I do it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen and amen. I pray that God speaks to you personally today. We've been talking about uh, the fact that spiritual warfare doesn't always look like in the movies. It doesn't always look like somebody with their head spinning around, throwing up blood and stuff flying across the room. Hey, that stuff is real. I'm, I'm not discounting that. That stuff is real. But we're focusing on the more everyday, the more day-to-day -day and, uh, and the... Um, the more subtle ways that the enemy just kind of attacks us, just kind of influences us, and, and, it's, and it, it might be not as radical, but it's still just as dangerous. It's still just as dangerous. And, and today I want to start talking about investments. Investments. Now, 
I know that everybody, uh, I mean, all of us, we just, we want to make great investments, whether it be investments with our time. You know, nobody wants to just waste time. You know, it happens. I mean, you get on YouTube and then you look up and it's been 45 minutes. You're like, what happened, right? You're watching cats for 45 minutes. Nobody intends to do that. We want to make good investments with our time. We want to make good investments with our money, with our effort. Like, you don't want to work hard and not, you know, get a return. No, you want to make a good investment in what you put energy into, what you invest time into. I mean, we want a, a good return on our investment into relationships. I mean, we want them to be good relationships and have harmony and everything. I mean, and again, um, I, I believe that nobody wants to just waste time, money, effort, emotions, no? Uh, we all want a good return on our, on our investments. And the other side of that coin, I believe is also true. I believe that we wanna make good investments, but the other side of that coin is, I believe that none of us wanna miss out on a good investment. And to, and to illustrate this, I, I read a couple of um, articles this week, um, some things that I didn't know, maybe you're aware of, but uh, I read this article um, about a guy named George Bell, who in 1999, this particular guy, he was given him and, and the corporation or the company that he headed, they were given an opportunity to purchase another company for a million dollars, one million dollars. Right, a million dollars is just a lot of money. But at the time, actually, in negotiation, they were actually able to knock the price down to about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in negotiation. But still, George Bell decided that you know he, he was scared of the investment. Maybe the, at the time he didn't see the value in the invest in the investment, and he passed. I mean, granted that at this time that particular company was based in a garage, right? In, in California, in Menlo Park, California. But um, the name of the company was Google. And he, George Bell had the opportunity to buy, to purchase Google in his starting points for about $750,000, but he passed. He, he, he missed the opportunity. Now I looked it up today and um, Google, according to Forbes magazine, or Alphabet, which is like the parent company, I'm told, um, is valued today at about a little over $730 billion. Woo! All right, so that's incredible. Now, um, so that's, that's significant. Now, in the 2000s, in the, in the 90s or 2000s, if you wanted to go watch a movie, this is where you went. I mean, this was the spot, right? I used to love going to Blockbuster and I miss it. I don't know about you, but I still miss it going to the store and like finding out like what's there. Like, I, like, I don't know if you know, but Tuesdays was when the new releases came out, right? And I used to be there on Tuesdays to get the new releases and everything. But now, now is a little different. Now you just turn on your TV and we got smart TVs or your iPad or whatever. And now we just go straight to Netflix, right? And you don't have to worry about if somebody's checked it out or if you put in the VCR and they didn't rewind it. Why didn't they rewind it? You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, but you don't have to worry about that because you just go to Netflix or whatever. And then in this article I was reading, um, I learned that in the year 2000, Blockbuster had the chance to buy Netflix for $50 million. That's a lot of money, $50 million, right? Um, granted at the time, I don't know if everybody remember, but Netflix used to be a mail DVD service, right? You used to get DVDs in the mail, uh, and uh, rumor has it um, that Blockbuster laughed Netflix out of the building. $50 million, you're mailing DVDs? Of get out of here man we're not interested and, and 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 for good reason probably because in 2004 blockbuster had more than 9,000 stores just in the United States just in the United States right now as of February 2018 there were only eight blockbuster stores worldwide in the whole world there's only eight Blockbuster stores, and in all of America, there's only one, and it's in 
Bend, Oregon. So if you if you really want to go to Blockbuster and get a movie, you got to go to Bend, Oregon. This is the last standing uh, Blockbuster store. Today, Netflix is worth more than a hundred billion dollars. Is Netflix worth according to the sources that I read? And and and. We could talk about this all day. This is fun, right? We could talk about um, stories of people making great investments or, or missing out on great investments. And, and it's easy for us to just kind of listen to this information or for me to read something like this. And now after the fact, it's easy for us to kind of be like, man, I can't believe that they passed on such a big opportunity or that chance for that incredible investment. And again, it's easy because we know how it played out. We know how much these companies are worth today, but in the moment, we probably would have passed up as well because of fear, because of, hey, currently I don't see the value in this. And, and maybe you're wondering, Aniba, what does Netflix and Blockbuster have to do with spiritual warfare? I'm glad you asked. And it's because I am convinced that one of the tactics, the everyday tactics that the enemy uses in our lives as, as spiritual warfare is to blind us, is to blind us to the significance, to the importance and the value of us investing into our spiritual, spiritual lives, investing into our relationship with God. And we've talked about ways for you to invest in your relationship, whether it's reading your Bible or coming to church or being in a group or, you know, uh, life groups or just being in community. I mean, there are so many ways. And, and, and for whatever reason, it's so easy to find something just more important, something more pressing at the time, right, that we don't have the time. I can't go. I have other things to do. And I believe that. This is a tactic of the enemy to blind us to the importance of, of sowing those seeds of faithfulness, of, of, of being faithful and seeking God, even when you don't feel it or even when you don't get anything, right? You read your Bible, I didn't get anything today. Well, maybe what you're reading is not for today. Maybe it's for something that you're going to encounter later. But sometimes we get discouraged, discouraged and, and we just don't see the value. We don't see the importance. We don't see the significance. And, and I believe this because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says that Satan, who is the God of this world. We talked about this verse a few weeks ago. He is the God of this world. And what does it say? He has blinded the minds of those who won't believe, of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is exact likeness of God. Right? So he blinds the minds of unbelievers, but I also believe that he blinds our minds. He blinds our, ourselves, even as believers, even as Christians, just of the value, the importance, and the significance of us investing and pouring into our relationship with God. Now, we all invest in different things. When I say investment, I don't want you to just think about money. I mean, we invest in our education, right? And, and, and that's great, right? I mean, because if you invest in your education and you try hard and you do real well, I mean, in our society, a great education uh, equals, equivalates to, to good opportunities and maybe a good job and, and just um, know a good career. I mean, people invest in sports. I don't know how many people I've talked to where Saturdays and Sundays, I mean, they're, they're at the park, they're at the field for three, four hours maybe, right? And they're just investing all this into the sport because uh, maybe they got friends on the team or they're building community or camaraderie or, or maybe my kid will get, he's, he's incredible, right? Maybe he'll get a scholarship one day or be, and people just invest into all these things. I mean, we invest into our health, right? And we buy the right you know, uh, produce and all the organic stuff and, and we, we exercise or you exercise, right? Like, um, but, but you have people and, you know, invest in relationships, which is wise for you to invest because again, you want to be happy. You want to have harmony in the home and, and people also invest into, into their careers just for financial security and stability and the freedom to be able to, 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 you know, to, to live comfortably or to be a blessing to others. And all of those things, all of those things are awesome. Nothing wrong with those things. 
in and of themselves. The problem is that how often, and you know this, you know this, how often all of these things take precedence over our relationship with God, don't they? I can't, I, can't, I can't come because I got to work or no, my daughter couldn't come or my son can't go because this. And, and I know, right, and, and, and we invest into all these things and, and I believe, and, and, and I'm not here, the, guy, the pastor saying, so you got to be right. I mean, if you got an important tournament, it's fine to miss once in a while. But every time, every single time, when a birthday comes up and it collides with your schedule of church, what wins? Oh, I got to go every time. And what are you telling your soul? That everything else is more important than your relationship with God. And that comes from the enemy. And when I say enemy, a lot of times I'm talking about the en and me, right? In the me, I'm a sinner, right? So yeah, the enemy definitely... You know, moves things around and, and birthdays are always on Sunday, right? And tournaments are always on Sundays at 4 p.m. apparently, right? And, and all these things, the enemy can definitely, but, but we're sinful. We're bent, we're bent away from God and, and the enemy, he loves that. And I, and I believe that is a, a big part of our spiritual warfare that we have to be aware because, yeah, not always following Christ is not always going to be convenient. But when you do something, even though it's inconvenient, what are you telling your soul? Hey, this is important. I value this more than other things. God honors that. I believe I'm convinced of it that God honors that. So all those things that we talked about are great. But today's message in a sentence is this. And I didn't come up with this. This is a quote from uh, Rick Warren. And he says, look, nothing compares to getting your sins forgiven, a purpose for living, and a home in heaven. Right? That rhymes and everything, right? So it'll be easy for you to remember. Nothing compares to getting my sins forgiven, getting a purpose for living, and getting a home in heaven. Yes, I have opportunity to go here and to invest in other things. Yes, I've got an invitation to go there, but nothing compares for getting my sins forgiven, a purpose for living, and a home in heaven. So when the enemy comes and he wants to trip me up or get me out of routine or, or, or just get me investing my time, my energy, my effort, my money, and other things that are good unto themselves, but if they take the place of God, then you know that it's not leading anywhere good. I don't know how many times somebody comes, starts coming to church and they're just excited about church and they want to, and then they find a job and they got to work on Sundays, right? I, I don't know how many times, but remember, nothing compares for us getting our sins forgiven, a purpose to live in, and a home in heaven. So tell the person next to you before we continue, just tell the person next to you, hey, don't miss this deal. Right? Don't be like Blockbuster. Right? Don't be like George Bell. Don't miss this deal. All right? Because this is incredible. And you don't have to do anything for it. You just have to receive it by grace. So today, we are going to continue the story that we've been studying for the past two weeks. And uh, just to do a quick recap, uh, if you guys remember, Jesus and the disciples were in Capernaum. And then Jesus in the evening told them, hey, let's go ahead and cross over to the other side. And when they were crossing over, what happened? While they were in the sea, there was a storm, right? And Jesus was sleeping uh, with his head on a cushion, which we talked about last week, which is kind of kind of neat. Um, and then uh, Jesus calmed the storm. And when they arrived, they arrived at a graveyard. And then there was this demon possessed guy naked, running around, chained up. And, and he went up to Jesus and kneeled before him and begged him, hey, don't send us out, right? Just cast us into the pigs. And we talked about the reasons why the demons went into the pigs, right? Because there was no cats around. Because they would have definitely gone into the cats, but there was no cats. So they just went into the pigs. And Jesus expels the demons. And they go into the 2,000 pigs. And then all the pigs kill themselves. So... This is where we pick up the story in Mark 5, starting in verse 14. The Bible says, the herdsmen, so the people that were kind of taking care of the pigs, right? They were like, hey, I ain't getting brain for this, right? Like, I'm going to go tell somebody exactly what happened, right? So they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. 
people rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, right? Lots of demons, 6,000 of them maybe, right? He was sitting there fully clothed, right? And perfectly sane. And, and they were all afraid. They were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened uh, told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. Maybe the disciples, you know. Uh, maybe they were telling them what happened and, and everything. And the crowd, the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Wait a minute. Did I read that right? And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. I don't know how many of you guys have read this story before or maybe studied it or heard it before, but um, I have. But I remember one of the first times that I read this story or read the story, I... Um, I was surprised by the end. I don't know how many of you have ever watched the movie or like read a book and you were just sure. You're like, I've, I've seen the ending before. I know how it's going to end, right? The guy's going to get the girl and they're going to be happily ever after. Or the good guy's going to get the bad guy and rescue everybody. And, and you just kind of know how it's going to end. Um, but then there's a switch, right? And, and then you're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. That happened to me recently with a movie called Upgrade. It's a new movie that came out, it, it, classic action film, and you're like, oh yeah, the good guy's gonna get the bad guy. But then at the end, there's this twist, and I was like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. It was kind of cool. Uh, but this kind of happened to me with this story, right? Because when, when I was reading the story, I kept remembering this other story, when Jesus went into a different town for the first time, if you remember, uh, Jesus went into this town and he met with this Samaritan woman at a well. And she, he was talking to her and then he, he told her like a lot of things about her. And she was so amazed that she ran into town and she was like, hey, I think that I just encountered the Messiah. Come and look. And then everybody went out there. And then, you know, at the end of that story in John 440, the Bible says that when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. They begged him to stay. So Jesus stayed for two days. And, and reading this story about the Legion guy, I was like, I mean, sure, this is what's going to happen. I mean, the people are going to come out and see the, the crazy naked guy that was tormented, cutting himself, running around naked with chains. And now they see him clothed. And now they see him sane. And I thought that they were going to be like, wait. Stay right there. I'm, I'm going to get my wife because she's crazy, right? Like, I'm going to get my cousin. I'm going to get my dad who can't stop drinking. Or I'm going to get my aunt who is sick. Because if you can do that, then maybe you can work in this other stuff. But, but that's not what happened, is it? That's not what happened in, in this story at all. And again, it's easy for us to, to look at this story and kind of look down on these people and think about them kind of like those companies and the investments opportunities like man i can't believe that they passed on that what a missed opportunity why did they tell jesus to leave no they they, they wasted that opportunity forgot to to just kind of work in their lives maybe give them a new purpose a new direction in life maybe new right out of necessity comes creativity and ingenuity maybe god could have done something but they wasted it but but it's important for us to look at this story from the different perspectives, right? Because this whole story through the eyes of the disciples must have been awesome, right? I mean, they're in the boat and there's a storm and they tell Jesus, he's like, quiet, be still. And they're like, who is this guy? And then they see this guy who nobody can control, who nobody can even buy, not even with chains. And he's kneeling before God, uh, Jesus and then... Jesus casts out these demons and, and they see all the pain. I mean, the, the, the disciples would have been like, I'm with this guy, right? Like, I'm with him. Like, what's up, right? Like, Jesus, like, I'm following him. Like, it must have been awesome for the disciples. It must have been awesome for the Legion guy, maybe. I, I assume that, I don't know how long, the Bible doesn't tell us how long he was tormented by these demons, but the fact that he was no longer 
just running around like a beast, naked, chained up, harming and, and howling and just being tormented, right? Now he's fully clothed. He's completely sane. That must have been a great day. I mean, maybe he had a family, maybe he had kids, a wife, maybe he can go back home and just be part of that community. I mean, that must have been a great, great day for the disciples and for this Legion guy, which we don't know his name. Um, but you know who this experience wasn't awesome for? The pig farmers. This day sucked for the pig farmers, right? Like, I mean, this was a terrible day for the, the, the pig farmers. I mean, the story tells us that, that the people that were, you know, taking care of the pigs, they ran to the town and the country. So maybe there was like multiple investors, you know, maybe this was just like a pig farming town. Like this was a bad, bad day for these people, right? I mean, they lost their business. There was definitely a loss of a lot of money. I was trying to list, you know, trying to see if there was like a, an amount of money. I found this article. Again, this is not like theology. This is just speculation. But if there were like show pigs versus just pigs to, you know, I said, not carnitas or something, right? Like, uh, you know, the value significantly differentiates. But, but there was at least 500 grand worth of pigs in 2,000 pigs. I mean, that's a lot of pigs, right? And, and again, I mean, we can talk about how these people were focused more on the material possession and their financial status more than the presence of Jesus, right? I mean, we could definitely talk about those kind of applications. And I think they're valid because a lot of us, you know, we especially in the United States, right? Materialism and in our in our in our financial status, it, it's it's something that definitely interferes with our relationship with God. But I want to focus on something else, um, and I think something that applies to every single one of us. I want to focus on on the element of fear. I want to focus on this element of fear because Mark he emphasizes the fact that when the crowd gathered around Jesus, they saw the man right surely after they saw the pigs floating and that whole chaos. Mark says that when they saw the man who had been possessed by this legion of demons, they saw him sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And the Bible says that they were all afraid. They were all afraid. Now you're afraid? Now that he's clothed and not naked? Now that he's seated and, and not running around like some beast, some maniac, right? Now that he is harmless and not dangerous with like chains hanging around him and, and like rocks or, or whatever it was right now that he's quiet and not screaming now that he's peaceful and not tormented. You're afraid now that he's sitting among the living instead of running around among the dead. Now that we're afraid. Why? I believe that they were scared of Jesus. I believe that they were scared of Jesus. I believe that they were afraid of being in the presence of someone greater. Being on the sure that we're afraid of the future. What's the future going to hold? I mean, we lost our job. We lost our income. What are we going to do? Sure, they were afraid of the unknown. They didn't understand what was happening. Sure, they were afraid of change. They were, the whole society, the whole community was going to have to go through ex lots of changes, right? And, and nobody likes change. We're all afraid of change to a certain degree. But, but above all those things, I believe that they were afraid of being in the presence of of someone great because all throughout the scripture we see we see this happening other times I mean just getting there the disciples when they encountered the storm the Bible says that they were scared in the storm they, 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 they went up to Jesus and they said Jesus don't you care that we're about to drown but when Jesus calmed the storm what does it say they were absolutely terrified why because at that moment, they were like, wait a minute, we might be in the same boat, but we're nothing like this guy. This is some, I mean, he is much greater than we are. In the Old Testament, Isaiah tells us about either a vision or an experience that he had where he saw God. And in Isaiah 6, 5, he says, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. 
He said, For I am a man of unclean lips. I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I mean, he, he was scared, like, I'm about to die. I am ruined because I am in the presence of someone greater. Peter had an experience similar to this one. If you remember the story, when Peter fished all night and didn't catch anything, and then Jesus asked him to borrow the boat, and he taught from it, and after he was like, let's go a little deeper, and then he filled his boat and his buddy's boat with fish, and then Peter, I mean, yeah, Peter in Luke 5, 8, says that when he saw this, when he saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, what did he say? Go away from me. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Because there's nothing that exposes something dirty like something clean. Right? Beauty it, it, it exposes ugliness. And, and, and nothing exposes emptiness like the fullness of Christ. And, and I believe that these people in this town, they told Jesus to leave because they were more accustomed and they were more used to the presence of this possessed man. That in a way, they were more comfortable with the presence of the devil than with the presence of God. They were more comfortable with the presence of the devil than with the presence of God. And they were... Afraid, They were afraid of what that would mean to them, right? What that would mean for them. And I believe that the enemy attacks us with that same fear. Whether you haven't given your life to Christ yet and you are afraid of, well, if I give my life to Christ, then what's going to change in my life? What am I going to have to render? What, what kind of things am I going to have to stop to do? What kind of things am I going to have to start to do, right? And, and then uh, how is this going to change my relationships, my credibility at work or in social, you know, gatherings or whatever? But even as a Christian, even as a Christian, we fear of being labeled as a fanatic. Uh, and we fear, you know, about just just. The different things. Well, you know, if, if I completely give my heart to God, then I'm not going to be able to do what the things that I want to do and go to the places I want to go and drink what I want to drink and watch what I want to watch. Right. I, I won't be able to hang on to this, this grudge and this, this thing in my heart against that person, because if I completely follow Christ then I know I'm going to have to surrender that to him, what is it going to mean for my finances? Right. I mean, if I completely give my heart to God, then that means that my money goes where my heart is. And, and, and what is that going to be for, for me? And, 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 and we're afraid. There's so many different elements around what if I completely give my heart to, to God? And, and I believe that the enemy is behind all that because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7 that God is not the one that gives us a spirit of fear. That spirit of fear doesn't come from God. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter 5 8, the Bible tells us to stay alert and to watch out for your great enemy, the devil, because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I've, I've read this verse multiple times and then uh, just kind of studying about um, spiritual warfare and the enemy and the different names he has. And, and I encountered this thing about the Bible using this analogy of the enemy being like a lion. And notice that he's like a lion, right? He's like a lion because only God is the lion of Judah, right? But he's like a lion. He pretends to be this thing, but he, it's this analogy of an lion. And then I, it was interesting and actually really cool to study about lions and how they hunt in the wild. And, and this is fascinating. And let me just show you, share with you some of the things that I learned. Um, interesting fact about lions in the wild, uh, mostly like in Africa and stuff, um, most of what they eat are gazelles and antelopes. But both of those animals, gazelles and antelopes, are actually faster than a lion. I mean, lions are pretty fast. They can run pretty fast, you know, once they get going, they, but, but they're like a train, right? They, they, they're pretty fast, but if they're going in a straight line, they can't like jump around and change directions really fast. So gazelles, they, you know, they're faster. They can get away from a lion. So 
the, the good thing about a lion is that they're super good at hiding, amazing at hiding. Lions are extraordinarily patient, which if you think about that in the element of the enemy, like a lion, he's patient. There's a lot that we can think about right there, right? He might not get you here, but he we're gonna, right? And he's patient with you or whatever, but the lions are extraordinarily patient. And then lions, they work together with other lions. Lions are the only social cat I, under, I, I learned, right? Because cats are usually like loners, hidden, you know, you don't, you don't see them unless they want something, right? That's why they're from the enemy. So, um, so lions are the only social cat and they work together and they hunt with uh, lionesses. You know, the lion is actually not the one that, that does the hunting. The lion's not the one that does the grocery shopping because if it was like, you know, he wouldn't get the right stuff on the list, right? Like he would get the right brands and he wouldn't check prices and he would pay too much because he wouldn't use any coupons, right? That's why the lionesses are the ones that go hunting. Um, so those are just things my wife tells me that I do apparently. Uh, so so the, the, the lionesses are actually the ones that hunt. So the tactic is that the lion actually finds a really good hiding spot behind its prey, behind its prey. The lionesses then surround its prey around the other side, also hidden so they can't see it. And then when everybody's in position, the lion roars as loud as he can. And instinctively, the antelopes and the gazelles, what do they do? They run away from what scares them. They run away from, wait a minute, that's coming from over there? I'm going that way. And what happens? They go right into the trap. They go right into the trap. And uh, in a similar way, I believe that the enemy attacks us in that same way. He attacks us in, in that he wants us to be scared of God and what God wants to do in our lives and and he'll condemn you and we talked about how the enemy will condemn us and accuse us and guilt us right into thinking that that you're not worth it and God can't do anything with you after what you did you think God can work in your life and he scares us with thoughts of judgment but what if I give my life I mean he's gonna accuse me he's gonna judge me for what I've done and and and, and the enemy says well if you give your life to the Lord you're gonna lose control you're going to lose credibility. You're going to lose your social you know, circles and you're going to lose friends and they're going to call you a fanatic religious nut and, and it just scares us. And what do we do? What do we do with things that scare us? A lot of times we're no different than the gazelles. We run away and what happens? We fall right into the trap. We fall into the trap of just living for today, living for pleasures, living for the things of this world, which are all govern governed by the enemy. But if the gazelles and these antelopes would switch their thinking and hear the roars and, and, and know, and like now you know, and know, wait a minute, this is a trap. And I know this scares me. I know that God is calling me out of my comfort zone, but I'm not gonna run away. I'm gonna run towards the thing that scares me because I can maneuver around the lion, right? The lion is not that fast. I can just maneuver around her and he's not going to get me. I'm going to keep my life and I'm going to do great things for God because I'm not running away. I am pursuing the thing. You know, the Bible says, hey, broad is the way that everybody's on. But narrow is the way that God calls us where we find everlasting life. And uh, I, I encourage you today to, to run towards the roar. Run towards the thing that scares you because God has plans for you. He wants to do great things in your life. And, and the enemy, he might roar. He might roar, but the enemy ain't got no teeth. Because Jesus knocked him out of the cross, right? He knocked him out of the cross when he died for our sins and raised up victorious on the third day. And, and again, um, the Bible says that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. Through him. Remember, Jesus didn't cross the sea to condemn this demon possessed guy and tell him, Well, why do you get demon possessed? What were you doing? I can't believe it, right? No, no, no. 
He prepared a little pack with clothes that we're thinking was that cushion. Maybe I, th I like that. I like that thought, right? And he, he crossed over not to condemn him, but to cover his nakedness, cover his shame and set him free. So let's run towards the thing that scares us. Right. So Jesus, Jesus, um, at the end of the day, he's a gentleman. And Jesus is not going to stay where he's not wanted. I mean, Jesus knocks on the door of every heart, but he's not going to knock the door down. He's, he's not going to do that. And, and the Bible tells us that when the crowds began pleading with Jesus to go away, Jesus was getting in the boat. He was like, you don't want me around? Okay, I'm out. I'm gone. Right? So... Those are all things that God kind of put in my heart to share with you. And uh, you're like, where are the points? Like, I'm, I'm waiting for the points. I'm waiting to take notes and what's going on. And you either you forget. I didn't forget. And these are just going to come really fast because I just want to share just three quick truths about Jesus. And three quick truths about why you don't want to miss this deal. Why you don't want to run away from the thing that scares you. Three reasons why you want to run towards God. And number one is because Jesus offers you rest for your soul. Jesus offers you rest for your soul. And this story says that the crowd gathered around this guy who, who was possessed by a legion of demons. Who earlier we hear that he was tormented, that he would howl in the night, cutting himself with stones. But now he is sitting down. Perfectly sane. Perfectly sane. With peace of mind. With peace in his soul. And, and, and man, it's so easy to get bogged down today with just stress and anxiety and guilt and shame and negativity and depression and, and all these things. But Jesus tells us in, in Matthew 11, um, verses 28 and 29, he says... Um, I'm going to read it because this is not changing for me. Uh, the Bible says, uh, then Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Rest for your soul. If you come to Jesus, he's not going to bog you down with a bunch of religious duties of what to do. No, no, no. He wants to enter into a personal relationship with you and give you rest for your soul. Number two, if you can pass it along with me, Jesus is merciful with you. Jesus, if you can go ahead and change it to number two, Trent, is, is merciful with you. I don't know how many times I have, um, you know, heard people talk about how they, they don't know if they can follow God or if they, if they make a decision, they're scared that they're going to let God down. And I, I always laugh because I'm like, that's actually the good news because you are going to let him down. But he loves you in spite of you. He loves you in spite of you. God's love for you does not depend on you. There's nothing that you can do that, that's going to God love you more. And there's nothing that you can do that's going to make God love you less. Right? So God is merciful. And, and, and uh, this phrase, uh, I heard it years ago. And you've heard it too. You know, when people say, I'm scared of letting God down. And I'm like, you can't let him down because you were never holding him up in the first place. <laughs> He's the one that holds us up in his grace with his mercy. He's the one that holds us up. So you don't have to be scared of that. Uh, Mark 5, 17, if you can change that. Um, when, the, when the crowd began to plead with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Um, it reminds me of the verse in John 1, 10 and 11, where Jesus says that he came, right? The very word, the very world he created. Jesus came to the very world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. And while they rejected him in verses Mark 18 and 19, um, it says that when when Jesus was getting into the boat, the man that had been possessed begged Jesus to go with him. 
And Jesus told them no. Jesus told them, go home to your family and tell them everything that God has done for you. Tell them how God was merciful with you. And this is so powerful because when the people of that town didn't want anything to do with Jesus, Jesus left. He did. But he didn't leave them alone. He left them a missionary. He left them somebody, a reminder of what Jesus did for him and ultimately what God can do for them as well. And, and God, God is, uh, you know, he told this guy, hey, go to your friends, go to your family and tell them what God has done for you. And the people in town, just tell these people that although they rejected you, Tell them, look, although you rejected me and although you didn't have mercy on me, God had mercy on me. And I want to let you know that God has mercy on you. Don't run away from his mercy. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to adopt you. He wants to cover you. And number three, and to finish, Jesus has a purpose for your life. Jesus has a purpose for your life. There's nothing better than getting your sins forgiven and a purpose for living, right? In three occasions in this story, in verses 10 and 12, in three occasions in this story, we see people begging Jesus for something, right? In verses 10 and 12, the demons beg Jesus to send them into the pits. In, in verse 17, the townspeople are pleading with Jesus and begging people, hey, just go away, just leave us. And in verse 18, the formerly known legion guy, right, uh, begged Jesus to go with him. Now, in the, the first two, Jesus said, okay, you can go into the pits. All right, I'll leave. If you don't want me around, I'm a gentleman. I'm not going to knock the, house, the, the door down. But for this third guy, he begged him to go. And he said, no, no, don't. You can't come with me right now. I want you to I have a purpose for you, right? And, and, and again, um, this is verse 19. No, go home to your family and tell them everything that the Lord has done. And this is the spot where, where you know, maybe some of the disciples, if maybe you and I were there, maybe this is a spot where we would kind of call Jesus aside and say, um, <clears throat> hey, Jesus, um, I mean, I, I know that, you know, that, that you're God and, and, and this and the other, but. I don't think this guy is qualified to do this, right? Like, I'm sure that he doesn't even know, like, one Old Testament verse. Like, Psalm 23, Jesus, like, he doesn't know that. God is my shepherd, right? He, he doesn't know that one. Like, I mean, and, and this guy just came fresh out of a demon possession. This is a guy that you want representing you out there and telling you about God, right? And, and again, I mean, the truth is that you don't need any qualifications to love somebody. You don't need to be qualified to love someone. You don't need qualifications to sit down with somebody, to give somebody a hug or to tell somebody about what God has done in your life. And, and the Bible tells us in verse 20 that the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Now it says that the man went away and began to tell everybody in the Decapolis. This is a group of about 10 cities. And other versions of the Bible say um, that he went throughout the 10 cities. And we wonder, I was like, I mean, that sounds great, but did it work? Was, was it effective? Well, if we read on in the book of Mark and we go to chapter 7, verses 31 and 32. The Bible says that Jesus left the vicinity of a town, you know, of Tyre, and he went through Sidon down the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Capitals. So he went to the region where that demon possessed guy had been telling his story. People were seeing him. It's like, hey, how you doing, Robert? It's like, I haven't seen you with your clothes on in a while. He's like, yeah, I mean, you heard that thing about the pigs? Yeah, that was, that was me. And I mean, I met a guy named Jesus and he, he changed me. And, and that's, that's kind of what he did. And then when Jesus went to that same area, the Bible says that some people there brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. 
And they begged him. They begged Jesus again to put his hand on him. How, how did they know that Jesus could heal this man and work in this guy's life? How did they know to beg Jesus to do this? Because they had heard about it from, from the demon possessed guy, right? From, from, from Legion guy. And um, this, is, uh, this is so powerful because God, he not only wants to save you, he not only wants to get you in heaven, he wants to give you a purpose for living. That, that you have purpose in every step that you make because you, you represent God at, at every place that you go, right? Um, and, and God wants to use you in your school, in your job, in your family, in your circles of influence. And, and if he can use this demon-possessed guy, I mean, this guy was begging Jesus to go with him, and Jesus said no. And now we see these people begging for God to work in other people's life. Maybe that thing that you're begging God to take away, to resolve, and to just diminish, maybe God has a purpose with that. And to use you through that to minister and to help somebody else. Because the truth is that there is no better deal. There is nothing better. Nothing compares to getting our sins forgiven, to getting a purpose for living, and having a home in heaven. Amen? Thanks again for joining us at Church Online this morning. I hope that you are walking away with some powerful truth that you can remember and embrace and put into practice in your journey with the Lord. We talked about this the, the most common tactic of the enemy that is to try to intimidate us with fear. But again, remember that the enemy may roar, but he doesn't have any teeth because Jesus knocked him out at the cross. Amen. He is like a, a lion, but we know that God is the lion of Judah. And if he is for us, who can be against us? Remember that Jesus offers you rest for your soul. He is merciful with you, but more importantly, he wants to give you purpose for your life. Jesus said that the enemy, his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but that he came to give us life and life in abundance. He wants to not just save you and take you to heaven, but to have you live with joy, with hope, and with freedom and purpose here on earth. What is there to be afraid of that? Let us run towards the roar because we know we're faster than the enemy. We can maneuver around the lion. Amen. Plus God is with us. His Holy Spirit is in us. We have the church. We have the word of God who can be against us. So let us run. Let us run towards the roar. Let us get out of our comfort zone for God's glory and for our ultimate good. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. God bless you. I pray that you have a beautiful rest of your day, a great week, and I hope to see you next Sunday at Church at the Park at Tom Sawyer at 11 a.m. God bless you and have a great day.